to get this conversation started, we're going to have a conversation between two people who barely need an introduction. Uh, extended biographies are available in your program for all of our speakers today. So we won't spend a lot of time um, introducing people. I do want to say that um, Ambassador Jim Dobbins is a name that, that should be quite familiar to all of you. Um, he has spent many years in the field, um, back here in Washington working at RAND, um, studying nation building, studying conflict, understanding how we can do it better. And um, when he was named the, uh, the new special representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan, um, it occurred to me that, that there were very, very few people in the world who could really step up to, to that challenge of that position. So I'm extremely pleased that, uh, that Jim Dobbins will be joining us this morning. In the media, uh, a lot of people have gone negative on our field, um, and um, some of it's justified, some of it is not so justified. Um, but David Ignatius of the Washington Post has been uh, uh, one of the few mainstream uh, journalists, uh, columnists, who regularly write about the things that are happening in our field with a depth of knowledge and intelligence um, that, that many of us in this room would envy. And it's my pleasure to, um, to have David Ignatius and Jim Dobbins uh, join us on the stage for a conversation about where this field's going. So thank you to, to Robert Lamb. Thank, thanks to all of you. I'm David Ignatius. Uh, I want to introduce uh, Jim Dobbins, who's really our speaker, but I want to do so with a few introductory remarks. As Robert said, uh, I have been looking at and thinking about this problem uh, now for feels like a couple dozen years. Um, I, I have to say that I think you're gathered here to discuss really the most important issue for U.S. national security policy. It isn't often seen that way, and I think that's part of the, the, the problem. But uh, the, the more I think about where we are in, in 2013, the more this set of issues seems to me to be ab absolutely central. Um, just to, th to think for a couple of minutes with you about what you've all seen, what I've seen uh, as a journalist visiting in and out. I've visited over, over this last decade, so many PRTs in Iraq and Afghanistan trying to find a new way to bring uh, development assistance, counterinsurgency assistance, uh, intimate contact with people. I, I can re recall going up and down the Kunar River Valley, hearing about the road strategy and roads were going to bring business and business was going to bring stability. And I can remember all the things in Helmand province, uh, you know, walking around Marja with people who were just telling you that stability was going to happen maybe tomorrow if it hadn't happened yesterday. And, and in, the, in, the, in the belts west of Kandahar, the same, the same feeling of uh, positive energy and dynamism, a whole similar set of hopes uh, and expectations in Iraq before that. And if we're honest, and look at the accomplishments of those programs, we have to admit that um, they're not what we, what we dreamed, that we spent an awful lot of money with, let's be generous, with uncertain results, um, where we're still hopeful, and we'll talk to Jim about what Jim's own uh, ex expectations are. But uh, now we're in the period where the expeditionary armies that allowed programs like the ones that I'm describing that I bet most people in the audience uh, can remember clearly. The, those expeditionary army, armies are coming home. Uh, and and uh, as the president says, uh, as his challenger Mitt Romney really ended up by the end of the campaign echoing, the period in which we'll do that, we'll send these big armies abroad uh, to stabilize conflict zones, probably is ending for some, some good long while. And so what I've been writing about is, is what I see as the power gap that exists as the armies come home. How does our country project power and shape events in this uh, incredible
incredibly turbulent world that, uh, that we see stretching uh, across Africa, the Middle East, uh, and Asia. When I look at the institutions in Washington that are nominally charged with dealing with problems like the ones that you're going to talk about today, here's what I see. I'm a journalist. I get to say whatever I want, so I'm going to be as frank as I, as I can. I see first USAID, an institution with a long and you know, uh, uh, admirable history, but uh, an institution that in, in the eyes of many people has become more of a, of a contractor than an operating agency, uh, an, an agency that's got an awful lot of its own bureaucracy that it has to deal with, an agency that worries an awful lot about what congressional appropriators and authorizers think and gets pretty nervous about about steps that it, it has to take. So uh, an agency that whose mission is central, but whose performance uh, is, is a complicated set of, of problems. I see the U.S. Institute of Peace and its magnificent building uh, next to the State Department, nicest real estate in town. Um, uh, and I see many friends there uh, who are doing wonderful uh, work, wonderful studies. But I see an institution that really if, if, if I were to say, uh, how does the USIP fit as an instrument of national power, I think a lot of people in the building would kind of run the other way, because that's not the way they want to be seen. And they feel that they can't do their mission if they're, if they're seen as being tasked uh, by the, the NSC, the interagency process. They, they, they're, they're very deliberately and self-consciously a, a, a boutique. I see the Conflict and Stabilization Operations Bureau at the State Department. You'll be hearing from uh, from its, its, its director uh, at the end of your sessions today. A wonderful idea. The projects that it's doing, I think, seem really good, but it's, it's pretty small. I mean, we're talking about the biggest foreign pro policy problem that the United States has, uh, by my account, and we have, you know, less than 200 people the last I counted. Uh, they, they've had to really narrow their focus to a few particular areas where they're going to try to make these operations uh, work. Um, so that, that can't be the answer. You, you see the CIA, which has as its political covert action mission shaping uh, developments um, in parts of the world that are, that are in turmoil. Uh, that's a complicated function, um, intersects in, in complicated ways uh, with political leadership. Um, but also, you'd have to say, it, it, the new director, John Brennan, uh, has made clear that he wants to bring that agency back towards it, its traditional mission uh, of collecting intelligence. So to the extent that that would be a place you'd look, um, uh, you have to be careful. And then finally, NGOs uh, doing such incredible work, the expertise that's been built up in that sector, the way that it's learned to, to cooperate and interact with governments is magnificent. And yet, if, if you look uh, from the s former Soviet Union, Russia itself, and the surrounding countries, Egypt and other countries in the Middle East and North Africa, you see that this is a world in which NGOs are having more and more difficulty, and not just American NGOs, uh, in operating in this turbulent political climate. Uh, I was just down in Tampa uh, visiting Special Operations Command. They bid large to fill this space. No one should have any doubts that uh, uh, Admiral McRaven and SOCOM think if, if you have a power gap uh, that needs to be filled, there is a network of people in 80 countries around the world and they're ready to fill it. So, uh, and, and there's a lot, there are a lot of ways uh, that I'm sure you all understand in which they're, they're, they're a compelling uh, participant in, 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 in efforts uh, to, to, to deal with this stabilization reconstruction problem. So that's what, I, that's what I see when I look at the map. Um, when I look at the news or when I travel, I, I'm seeing uh, Egypt uh, you know, struggling to make a revolution work. Uh, you'd have to say so far, honestly, unsuccessfully. Uh, I see Syria in the, in the throes of a rev revolution that you'd have to say, honestly, right now is leading to the breakup of the country, the, the collapse of, of Syria's ability to, to function uh, as, as, as one country. So um, the agenda couldn't be larger. Uh, the stakes couldn't be higher. I feel as a journalist that we in my business don't write enough about what all of you in this room do. Um, that it, it really is at the center of our national security going forward. 
you are, the way that we're going to project power is interwoven with what you do. So um, that's why when Robert Lamb asked me if I would if I would come today, I said you bet, and I, I, I'm eager to hear uh, formally, informally uh, about your experiences as you go forward and struggle with this problem. So that's my uh, word of introduction. Let me turn now to, to Jim Dobbins. Um, there's a phrase that one of my professors in college used when he was talking, this is about the structure of the medieval world, and, and, and he talked about the great chain of being, uh, where, where, where power and knowledge was handed from person to person, generation to generation. And I, I hope I'm not overdoing it when I say that Jim Dobbins is part of the great chain of being in uh, U.S. national security policy. We have, we have great figures uh, whose names um, we celebrate at, at CIS in particular, uh, Dr. Uh, Kistner, Dr. Brzezinski, um, Richard Holbrook. Um, and then if you were going to extend that list, you'd extend it to Jim Dobbins. Um, first on Afghanistan, which I hope we'll talk a good deal about. Uh, that's now at the center of what uh, Ambassador Dobbins uh, does because he has replaced Mark Grossman, replacing Richard Holbrook as our uh, special rep representative off on for Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, he, it's fitting that he has this job because he was the person who was in there at the beginning, at the Bonn conference when uh, today's modern, postmodern, yeah, modern post-Taliban Afghanistan was created. Uh, and so I think really more than anyone, he knows the personalities in the story. Um, he also h was deeply involved in the transitions uh, in the former Yugoslavia, in, in, the, sta in the intervention and post-intervention stabilization uh, in, in Bosnia, in Kosovo, across that region. And so you could say that he's seen the, the toughest uh, example of this this challenge in Afghanistan, but they'll also seen uh, areas where it can be successful, and I hope that Jim will 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 explain to us what the source of the of of, of the success uh, where it's been found has been. But uh, with that introduction, I just would like to ask Jim uh, to to begin by talking about about his current mission. I think uh, Afghanistan has receded from the news some, but not from our concerns. Uh, Jim has overall responsibility as a special representative for guiding this policy. And uh, I'd ask you, Jim, to, to, to describe where we are now as you see it and where we're heading as we move toward the, the crucial year of 2014 in which our combat forces will leave and, and a handover to the Afghans will take place. Well, thank you. Um, Right. We are uh, indeed facing a, a number of important transitions over the next 18 months, a transition from uh, NATO and American combat operations to Afghan-dominated uh, combat operations, although our plans uh, do retain a small American combat force there after 2015, um, directed largely toward al-Qaeda and its uh, affiliates. Um, uh, a transition from a, a, an externally funded economic growth to a more internally uh, uh, promoted economic growth. Um, and uh, uh, a transition from no peace talks to ideally some peace talks. But the most important transition is the transition from a Karzai-led government to a somebody else-led government. Uh, uh, assuming this takes place, and I think there's every reason to believe it will take place, um, it, it'll be the first time in Afghanistan's history uh, that you've had a peaceful transition from one civilian government to another, indeed from any government to another. Um, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and this transition, more than anything else, I think will determine the prospects for Afghanistan. If it's successful, then the other pieces will fall into place, and if it's unsuccessful, it's going to be much more difficult. But let me try to put the experience in Afghanistan in some perspective, uh, given the larger topic that we're here uh, with today. Um, uh, I spent, uh, I've been in the, uh, back in the State Department for two months now, and I spent the previous 11 years uh, reflecting on an earlier set of experiences and, and looking at experiences of others in the post-conflict uh, reconstruction and stabilization field. 
uh, and uh, uh, just a few weeks before leaving the Rand Corporation, uh, Laurel Miller, a colleague, and I uh, finished a study which I think uh, illustrates uh, the overall experience in this area and puts the Iraq and, uh, and Afghan experience in some perspective because I think we're in danger of overlearning those lessons because they're first of all the largest of these efforts and they're the ones that we're most heavily engaged in, but they're not the only efforts. Um, at RAND we looked at uh, 20 uh, cases in which there had been a combination of a civilian and military intervention in a conflict or post-conflict society since 1989. In other words, nearly 25 years of experience. And this is a pretty comprehensive list that includes all the big American experiences, Somalia, Haiti, Bosnia, Kosovo, Afghanistan, and Iraq. It includes a dozen or more uh, smaller UN uh, uh, civil military operations and a few that were conducted by others. Um, and we, we tried to measure uh, the outcomes uh, in, these, uh, in these operations. Um, uh, that is, what did they accomplish? And we used a number of criteria. Um, we used uh, World Bank figures to determine uh, government effectiveness. Did, did, the, did the effectiveness of the government improve? The World Bank rates every country every year, so we've got an, an, an index, and so you can look over a 10-year period what was achieved, and, and we took a 10-year period. We used IMF data for economic growth. We used Freedom House data for dem democratization. Uh, and we used UNTP data for human development, which is a co that, that index is a combination of education, health, and standard of living. Um, uh, uh, and of course, we tried to determine whether or not the country or society was peaceful at the end of the 10 years, and then rated all 20 of them. Um, now, of these 20, 16 uh, were at peace. So the, 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 uh, the, the success rate for peace was quite high, 16 out of 20. Um, the, uh, uh, across the other indices, uh, they almost all, even the ones that weren't peaceful, showed a good deal of progress. That is to say, there was an improvement in democratization, there was economic growth, uh, there was improvement in human development, uh, and, um, uh, and there was I increases in democratization. Um, uh, and and uh, in, case, in terms of human uh, development, for instance, uh, these societies on average grew, uh, improved uh, at a higher rate than the world as a whole. In economic uh, develop, uh, growth, uh, they grew at a rate higher for the most part than their regions and their, uh, their sectors, in other words, uh, lesser developed, middle developed. They grew faster than those. So the, uh, the efforts, the, ass the assistance efforts, the reconstruction efforts, broadly speaking, achieved uh, measurable results across all of those. Um, uh, and I'll come to Afghanistan because its, remo its, its uh, uh, results were quite striking. Um, uh, in democratization, it was about at the average point, I think about a 15% improvement on the, in your Freedom House score over a decade. Uh, in uh, economic growth, it was the second highest of all 20. Um, in, uh, in government effectiveness, it was the third highest of all 20. Uh, and in human development, it was the highest of all 20. Um, and you can see that, and I'm not talking about absolute levels. Obviously, Afghanistan is not the most highly developed country in the world. It was the level of growth, the improvement in the index over that period that we're talking about. So all of these societies, if they started poor, ended up poor. If they were poorly governed, they ended up poorly governed. They were just less poorly governed and less poor at the end of the period. And Afghanistan, in the area of human development, was the highest. And, and this is because longevity has gone from 44 years to 60 years. Uh, you, you, uh, literacy has gone from 15% to 30-some percent, and it will be over 60% uh, by 2025 if the kids in school now stay in school. Um, uh, per capita GDP is up 130%. So across these indices, you see significant improvements. Now. Uh, Afghanistan was one of the four countries that wasn't at peace, which of course is uh, uh, why we intervene in countries. We don't intervene militarily in poor countries to make them rich, neither does the UN. Uh, and we don't send troops to authoritarian countries to make them democratic. We, we, the United States, we, the United Nations, we, the international community, sometimes intervene in violent countries to make them peaceful. And if you don't make them peaceful, then whatever else you've achieved 
you haven't achieved your central purpose. And we haven't achieved that yet in Afghanistan. Uh, we didn't achieve it entirely in Iraq. Uh, and the other two cases uh, that, weren't, that were uh, found to be not peaceful were um, the Congo and, uh, uh, and Somalia. Um, what was it that uh, differentiated uh, the peaceful from non-peaceful? The major differentiation was whether or not the entry of foreign troops was consensual. In cases where there was a peace agreement that needed to be enforced and the parties invited an intervention, with one exception, they were all successful. And this included cases where the peace was coerced. In other words, in Bosnia and Kosovo, we kept bombing them until we said, we're going to continue to bomb you till you agree. But they did agree. In other words, it was a coerced agreement, but it was an agreement. We didn't just enter and disperse the one regime and, and replace it with another regime. We compelled the regime to agree. Um, and so there were peace agreements in Bosnia and Kosovo um, uh, which have held. So that's the main differentiator between peace and non-peace. The other one is size. A country the size of the Congo is just very difficult to stabilize. Uh, they have a weak government. It can't control that much territory. And the international community simply can't afford to dispose the kind of assets that would uh, actually be able to stabilize a country of that size. Um, we found that none of the other uh, factors that, um, uh, that uh, you would think would determine success or failure, that is ethnic diversity, uh, levels of poverty, levels of education, levels of democratic experience, uh, all of those things had no effect on uh, levels of improvement. They obviously had effect on absolute out incomes. If they started rich, they ended up rich. If they had started democratic, they ended up democratic. But in terms of level of improvements, those had no effect. The two things that had effect were uh, geopolitics, whether you could curb the behavior of malign neighbors, uh, and secondly, whether you could successfully co-opt uh, competing patronage networks within the societies um, uh, in order to um, uh, get them to essentially uh, uh, seek rents peacefully and, uh, and competitively within a peaceful environment rather than violently. Um, uh, and in cases where you didn't uh, curb the malign behavior of neighbors, uh, and in cases like Iraq and Afghanistan where you actually tried to exterminate one of the patronage networks rather than co-opt it, um, you had less success in, in promoting peace. So those were the, 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 the lessons of the study. And I think it puts the Iraq and the, uh, and the uh, Afghan experience in some, uh, in some perspective and suggests that in drawing lessons for other situations around the world, we need to look at a broader universe of cases than just those two. Let me take uh, Afghanistan and your immediate challenge over the next uh, year, 18 months, um, and that is the political transition from uh, President Karzai, a man that you know all too well, I would, I would expect, over, over many years. But uh, we, c we can assume that um, with this uh, election transition, uh, we'll have some new political leader. Um, uh, the question I want to ask you is one that I find myself scratching my head over all the time, and that is how on this absolutely crucial decision for a country that we have decided is of enormous importance to the United States to the point that we have spent some hundreds of billions of dollars to influence <laughs> its future, how can we effectively shape this political transition uh, so as to get the best possible result for Afghanistan and for the United States, its, its interests, including the interests of neighboring countries, without going over the line, and I'll just leave that uh, definition fuzzy for the moment. Um, what, what are your thoughts about that? How do, how, do we, how do we shape a political environment without doing something that we shouldn't? Well, it's difficult. As I said, this is the most important transition, the one that's most crucial for American interests as well as Afghan interests. It's also the one over which we have the least leverage. Um, and to the extent we have influence, we have to be careful about using it for precisely the reasons you've suggested, that it could be counterproductive. Um, I think we need to be, first of all, we need to look uh, at both process uh, and, out and, and outcomes. Um, the international community, American public, European public, um, are going to uh, focus uh, heavily on process. Um, uh, is the election free and fair? Uh, 
Um, uh, uh, most Afghans are going to focus on outcome. Uh, did the, did the uh, process produce uh, somebody in whom they have confidence and somebody with whom they can, they can live? Um, uh, and uh, uh, I, I, I think the a polling after the last presidential election is indicative. Most Afghans, according to opinion polls, thought the election was fraudulent and were quite satisfied with the result. Um, uh, and, and, and so ideally we need to go for something which meets both those criteria. If the election is procedurally flawed uh, to a severe degree, that is it skews the outcome. And the, la and the fraud in the last election didn't skew the outcome. I mean it was clear that Karzai was going to win. Um, uh, that, the, that the degree of fraud which inflated his, his, his vote was unnecessary. He might have had to go to a second round. Um, but, uh, but he was 20 points ahead in the, and, and was certainly going to win. So there was, uh, the, the, the fraud in that case didn't skew the outcome. The fraud that did or, or, led or could have skewed the outcome would be much more problematic. So process does matter, but so does, so does outcome. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the Karzai is a controversial figure increasingly, but he has been successful in uh, creating a political and patronage network which uh, transcends sectarian boundaries in that country and which allows him to project political influence in Tajik, Uzbek, Hazara, and Pashtun communities in areas where the formal institutions of the state don't exist or are extremely weak. And so it's going to be important that this, uh, uh, that this upcoming campaign you know, produce an outcome which, uh, 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 which results in a leader um, that, uh, that has a, a substantial constituency across sectarian lines. And this means uh, uh, encouraging uh, Afghan uh, elites uh, to do as they are doing, to try to coalesce, to try to uh, put together not just individual candidates based on personalities and, uh, and command of small uh, 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 voter allegiances within narrow sectarian communities, uh, which is the natural pattern in an in electoral system in which there are no parties in which anybody can run and you have a two-term two -term, uh, presidential system, but rather to put together uh, slates uh, in which uh, a, a candidate has a couple of uh, a, a nominee, a, a vice presidential intentions who uh, are, are of different ethnicities than himself or herself, um, uh, uh, that has indicated who's going to be the defense minister, who's going to be the interior minister, who's going to be the economic minister, in general terms, so that they're running as a slate in effect. Um, and, and there are conversations among uh, Afghan elites trying to coalesce around uh, one or several candidacies that transcend narrow sectarian divides. And I think, you know, to the extent we can encourage that, and, and frankly, it's not something that we can directly influence other than benignly uh, noticing that it's going on and, and, and applauding it. Um, I think if that succeeds and if you get uh, uh, one, two, or three candidates who have coalitions of that sort, you know, then the, uh, then the election is more likely to produce a result that is of enduring uh, value for the country. So let me just bracket that and ask you to, to briefly expand on a part of it and not uh, necessarily restrict yourself to, to Afghanistan. But you neatly uh, described a basic dilemma that the United States has encountered uh, every place I can think of starting with, with Vietnam, which is that you, um, it's in our interest to find a leader who can put together a patronage network that allows the leader to uh, govern across uh, what are inevitably different uh, ethnic, clan, uh, tribal uh, divisions and, and operate effectively as a leader. Um, to that leader's opponents, to people who are not part of the network, that looks like corruption. And so as you travel in you know, in, in Kandahar and Helmand province and you hear about uh, Karzai and you wait for the government to deliver services, what you discover is that, you know, the government is seen as, and to some extent is, this network of patronage uh, appointees, uh, but not really a national government. And so um, how do you, uh, Jim, resolve that tension between having an effective patronage network and having something that's, 
a, 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 a clean uh, an, uh, enough national government that it that it meets those uh, those those first world tests. Well, first of all, I, I mean, I, I I think it's I think it's an overstatement and indeed uh, quite inaccurate to argue that the that the Afghan government doesn't deliver services. It, uh, it, it, you know, you're not you're not getting a doubling in literacy rates because the Afghan government isn't delivering education. It is delivering education. There are millions of children in school. Um, you're not getting increases in longevity because they're not uh, because they're not um, uh, projecting uh, health care uh, uh, more broadly in the population than it's ever existed in the past. Um, uh, you're not getting uh, increases in uh, public uh, uh, participation uh, because the government isn't um, uh, supporting a private network of you know 75 TV stations, um, cell phone towers that uh, give coverage to 90 percent of the country. 18 million telephone users, where there were only 40,000 10 years ago. Um, the government's either directly uh, uh, promoting those services, healthcare and, and education are largely government uh, run uh, 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 services in the country, or it's creating a, a framework in which private enterprise can uh, uh, profitably um, project things like cell phone, television, half the, half, the, half the families in the country have access to television. Um, uh, so, uh, so the government is uh, providing some degree of services. Now, you're absolutely right that one person's patronage network is somebody else's corruption, and uh, I, I think the levels of corruption in the country are uh, unacceptably high. Although, if you again, if you compare the country to its immediate neighbors, it has a, a slightly more efficient tax collection system than Pakistan. Um, uh, it, it certainly is. Uh, more democratic than China, Iran, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, or Turkmenistan, um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, and it's not noticeably more corrupt than many of those. And those are better comparisons than uh, Switzerland or even the Balkans uh, in terms of how quickly you expect this society to evolve. Um, uh, but that said, I, I mean I think that we do need to continue to try to contain corruption and criticize it where where we see it. Um, uh, but at the same time, we do need to understand that in a country with very weak institutions, none of which are more than a decade old, uh, none of which therefore inspire the kind of loyalty that our institutions inspire in us, um, uh, people are going to focus on how to help their brothers, their cousins, um, uh, their extended family, their tribe. Those are the primary loyalties um, that are likely to dominate the society, and one is working against that gradually by building up these formal institutions. That's a good answer. Um, I want to ask you to, to reflect a little bit on what I was describing as the toolkit for reconstruction and, and stabilization, this array of agencies in Washington. In the period that we're now living in, you know, when you, you, you're going to take care of the rest of this story of, of Afghanistan while our troops remain. But looking beyond that, uh, looking at a, at, a, at a toolkit that, as I said, has USAID, uh, USIP, CSB, um, CIA, uh, NGOs of various descriptions, how do you, how do you in your own mind, um, think about the use of those different instruments and what, what do you think um, we need to do uh, better to fill what I describe as the power gap uh, as, 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 our, as our big armies leave? How do, how do we fill that with, with those agencies, how directed, uh, or, or maybe with some new um, institutions that we, that we don't, don't yet have? Well, I think there are. I, I think our the civilian elements of our government are not as functional and not as integrated as they could be. And so I'll come back to that in a second. But I do want to put this in some perspective. You know, um, I commented before I took my current job um, uh, uh, on a number of occasions that that modern generals are fond of saying that there's no military solution to the problem they face, and this usually means they're losing. Um, and, and, and they're usually losing not because there hasn't been enough civilian capacity directed to the problem, but because there hasn't been enough military capacity directed to the problem. Um, that's not to say that you know, for in Afghanistan from 2002 to 2008 or so, or in Iraq for the first year, or year and a half, there were enough civilians. But the, but the inadequacy of the civilian response wasn't the reason those societies plunged back into civil war. 
Uh, the reason was that they weren't, we, we hadn't deployed a stabilization force that was adequate to the task. It didn't have a mandate and it didn't have the training and doctrine uh, necessary to conduct those kind of stability operations. And as a result, those societies degenerated back into, into civil war. Um, uh, uh, the, um, uh, so uh, it's very difficult in a conflict or post-conflict environment to register the kind of progress I talked about um, across these 20 societies if there's no security. And civilians are not going to bring security. Um, uh, civilians operate in an environment in which somebody else is going to have to provide security. Now, in some cases, indigenous institutions are capable of doing that. Um, but increasingly, um, we are finding ourselves in situations like Egypt, like Tunisia, uh, like Syria, um, where uh, we, the West, we, the international community, we, the United Nations, are not ready to deploy uh, peacekeeping forces, um, among other reasons, because the societies don't want them. I'm not suggesting this is necessarily a viable option. I'm just suggesting that trying to stay below societies with purely uh, civilian assets is, uh, is difficult. And uh, the lessons from the studies I've done really probably don't uh, entirely apply uh, in situations uh, like that. Now, in terms of the efficacy of our, our institutions, you know, my preference would be to see um, uh, the Agency for International Development rebranded the Agency for Reconstruction and Development, uh, that the various prog civilian programmatic uh, functions that are carried out elsewhere in the, civilian go in the, in the, in the uh, US government transferred to that agency along with development activities like uh, AIDS combating and, and uh, the, uh, the Millennium Challenge Times things, put all these development and reconstruction functions in a single agency, still subordinate agency to the State Department because in post-conflict environments, as I said, the most important factor for success or failure is the geopolitical factor. It's curbing the behavior of malign neighbors. And, uh, and a reconstruction strategy has to be directed from a policy standpoint um, not from a developmental standpoint, uh, but put all those, including the, the, the things in the State Department now, into a, uh, into a bulked up, much more substantial agency. I mean, that's my answer. That's what I suggested in the last, what was it called, the QDDR, um, Quadrennial Di Diplomacy and Development uh, Review. Um, it, it's, I think it's probably not gonna fly in the Congress. It certainly didn't fly in the administration. I don't expect to have any more success now that I'm in the administration, and it's not, <laughs> it's not an area for which I have any responsibility. So that's really a comment not from somebody in office, but from somebody who uh, had a lot of experience and some time studying these problems. Might make a good newspaper column, though. <laughs> it's all yours. Um, so I want to ask you, uh, one last question, then ask you to, to sum up the points that you most want to make to this audience. And my, my last question is, uh, again, one that vexes me when I travel. And that's the uh, intensity and persistence of anti-Americanism, sometimes in the countries that we have tried hardest to assist. And I think in particular of Pakistan, and Egypt. These are two countries that we know, that every policy analyst knows are, are crucial for the security and stability of the regions where they are. They're anchors for those regions. They're countries where there are historic ties between the, the U.S. and the military that ought to give us some, you know, a, a good starting point. They're places where heaven knows we've We've appropriated a lot of money. You know, it's not as if we weren't spending the money in those places. And yet, I find year after year, we just get, seem to get less popular. You know, to the point that, uh, that uh, the other day, the leader of this Egyptian liberal uprising won't even meet with Bill Burns. Holy smokes. Uh, how did that happen? So let me, let me just ask you to, to ruminate a little bit on on, on this problem of, of anti-Americanism, sometimes in the places we've tried hardest to help? You know, I don't, I don't know if I can give you a generic answer. There's clearly, uh, you know, people have written, why do they hate us, um, as 
r as it relates largely to the Arab or Muslim world. And, you know, there's a big literature on that, uh, and there are historic reasons that 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 really have relatively little to do with sp the specificity of what's happening in Egypt or or Syria at the moment. Uh, I I do think that that in places where we've successfully uh, contributed to uh, stabilization and reconstruction, societies that are peaceful and more prosperous as a result of our efforts, um, there's usually substantial gratitude and, uh, and, and a quite pro-American attitude, um, uh, not necessarily shared by those uh, 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 who were marginalized as a result of our uh, intervention or who's, uh, who were our initial adversaries. But even there, there's a grudging respect, for instance, in the Balkans. And, um, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and so this problem doesn't, doesn't exist. I mean, I think it's, it's partially um, uh, a, a function of, uh, of the, the broader issues of uh, integrating the Muslim world into a, a modern um, uh, uh, globalized world and uh, us as the, uh, the primary face of globalization, westernization, secular uh, democracy. Um, that uh, that creates some of this, and in some cases it's simply where we haven't succeeded. Um, that our that our efforts, however well-meaning, have been ineffectual, and uh, and because we're big and powerful, we get blamed for um, uh, for the difficulties of a society not successfully making a transition. So so, Jim, finally let me let me ask you to to wrap up this portion of the discussion. This group will talk through the day about really all the important uh, uh, stabilization challenges around the world and um, perhaps you could just leave them with your uh, uh, parting thoughts about, about the issues they, they need to think about. Well, I, I guess I would just argue, argue again for trying to put these problems in, in some perspective. You know, our, our, you know, because we're living in the middle of a, an admittedly somewhat turbulent era, um, uh, we tend to think that we're overwhelmed by the range of challenges and that the world is uh, chaotic and violent. But in fact, there have seldom been uh, periods where the world has been more peaceful uh, and less threatened by you know, catastrophic violence of the sort that we saw throughout the 20th century um, uh, and, uh, and indeed for much longer stretches of history. Um, uh, now, maybe we're coming out of a period of unusual peace, but certainly since the end of the Cold War, up to um, uh, uh, certainly up to up to 9/11, and even after 9/11, the number of people getting killed in wars was going way down. The number of uh, of internally displaced and refugees was going way down. The number of conflicts uh, was going way down. I mean, we reduced the number of conflicts in the world between 1989 and about 2000 by more than 50% and the casualties resulting from those conflicts by well more than 50%. And although uh, that pace of reductions slowed in the subsequent decade, it didn't stop entirely. Um, uh, and in Africa, there are far less uh, civil wars and violence today uh, than there have been historically since the end of the colonial era. Um, we're focused on the threat of, uh, of, of militant Islam in a few uh, countries and in Africa, and it's certainly something worth uh, worth being concerned about. Uh, but in but in terms of, uh, of levels of violence in that um, uh, in that uh, continent, um, uh, it it pales uh, in comparison with some, what you were seeing in earlier decades. So I think the whole thing has to be put in some in some perspective. And similarly, the success or failure of international interventions. As, as a whole, again, I think looking at the, the experience overall suggests that we're successful more often than not. Uh, uh, there is a, a big difference between trying to stabilize large populous countries and small countries. There's a big difference between trying to do it in countries you don't care a lot about and countries you do care a lot about. And clearly if the country's small and you care a lot about it, you're going to be able to have a more transformative effect on Kosovo or Bosnia, for instance, than if the country's really big and you don't care that much about it, the Congo, for instance, um, and, and you just have to accept that you can't replicate that level of success in big countries that you're not, that, uh, uh, you're not willing to commit that level of uh, engagement to. That was, for me, fascinating. I hope 
also for the audience. Have a wonderful day uh, talking about the biggest problem in the world. And, uh, and we, we wish you luck. Join me in thanking uh, Jim Dobbins. Thank you.